hosting. It's the first time doing a, a Google Hangout on air, so I've no idea how this works, but hopefully we're now live. It says end broadcast now in the top right, so hopefully that means we are broadcasting. What a professional broadcaster, doesn't even know when he's on air. So, well, welcome along, uh, guys, to the Audio Production Mastermind. This is session one. In fact, it's, it's really a bit of a test to see whether it works, because we're all new to Google+. Plus. I don't know how many of you guys have done Hangouts before, but we'll, we'll find that out in just a moment, and we'll go around and find out. Oh, we've got someone else joining in there as well. Uh, Darren has joined the Hangout. Darren, welcome. Hello, sorry I'm, sorry I'm late, sir. Sorry I'm late, No, that's fine. You're, you're perfectly fine. Um, so session one, uh, the title is How to Produce VoiceOver. So we're just going to sort of touch on uh, voiceover production. Once you've got a raw voice, how to pimp it up, uh, add that extra EQ, uh, compress it, and eventually make it into a sweeper. And also, if you're interested in making voiceovers into a, a funky demo, we'll uh, touch on that and post-processing as well at the end. So loads of little bits that uh, uh, would be great to get in. But first of all, let's introduce the people we've got in the Hangout now. Uh, I'll go from left to right as they appear on my screen. So first of all, we've got Ben Adam Smith on the Hangout. Ben, who are you? What do you do? And what's your favorite bit of audio kit? Well, I am Ben, obviously, and I run a production company called Regen Media, and I also have my own podcast called houseplanninghelp.com because I'm after um, building my own house and I'm building up my knowledge um, along with everyone else, hopefully helping them. So that's been about me. My favourite bit of kit? I don't know, Mike. That's a geeky question. With the microphone, how about that? that answer you? It has to be geeky. <laughs> We're geeking out about audio production here. I mean, how geeky does that get? The microphone, and you've got an Audio Technica review there. Yes. You're not on the Audio Technica tonight, are you? No, don't and don't set me uh, off near the settings again, or I'll make a complete hash of it. <laughs> okay. And so, what are you doing on your website? On the website at the moment, I'm uh, trying to build up um, knowledge about house building, particularly eco houses, and just chatting to lots of experts in the field. And that's how I'm doing my learning, really. Excellent. And how are you using audio with houseplanninghelp.com? Well, uh, in a big way, in a podcast, obviously, and I, I tend to um, have quite a few bits of production as well in the podcast itself, so a few bits and pieces. Fantastic. Ben Adam Smith, welcome along. Uh, going across to the right, we've got Darren Oldman there. Darren, welcome. Hello. Um, now, who, are, who are you? What do you do? Um, well, I'm certainly not him. Um <laughs> Uh, I'm Darren and I'm a voiceover artist, full-time voiceover um, with a broadcast quality home studio on ISDN um, where I send out voiceovers all over the world um, and yeah, that's me. And do you find you have to often do a lot of processing on your voices or are they generally sent out raw to the producers? Uh, if... If I'm on an ISDN session, then obviously it's directly down the line, so I don't touch it, it just gets sent. Um, if I am asked to do MP3, uh, it's generally raw, untouched, but I do do a, just a very subtle bit of um, processing. I've got, as I explained to you before, um, a preset which I use, which is just a very, very slight compression. It doesn't um, smash it like a lot of the presets, the voiceover presets do. You really, really notice that oh, something's yeah. going on. So I just add a little bit of compression and normalization to bring the level up. Um, just because I know that producers are going to um, do their thing and they're going to add their own presets and their own compressions, but I just like the idea of me sending a decent quality representation of my voice. Um, I have had um, fellow voiceover artists send me stuff, you know, just to sort of ask their ask my opinion on stuff, and I, you know, the level is very very low. It sounds thin, um, and yes, if I was a producer, I would do my thing on it. But I just like the idea of you know really sending them a not a overly compressed or overly <coughs> processed, but just a nice representation of my voice. Absolutely. And what's your favourite bit of audio kit you've got there in your uh, studio? It's got to be my Neumann U87. Clang. Oh, wow. Now, that is, a, that is a bit of kit. Do you think there's a difference between the uh, expensive mics like that one and, uh, uh, say, a more basic condenser microphone? Can you um, hear the difference, really? 
Well, that's a very good question. Um, on other voiceover forums, I always argue that if you're going to take this job seriously, um, you've got to get decent um, gear. There are enough voiceovers, you know, um, calling themselves professional voiceovers, um, you know, voicing in their cupboards with duvets hanging around them, um, where you can hear the, uh, the 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 echo of their room, you know, um, on on a, a cheap mic. Well, that's not being a voiceover. That's that's busking it, and a producer doesn't want to hear your room or a car go by or anything like that. They want to hear as if you were in a studio in Soho. So. When I decided, because I'm a musician, I'm a drummer um, primarily, but when I decided to uh, go into voiceovers, I, I thought, well, do it seriously, Darren. So I invested a lot of money. I've got a, compre I've got a purpose-built soundproof booth with layers and layers of insulation. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. I spent a lot of money, as you can imagine, on my U87, and I thought, no, 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 do it properly. Don't, don't busk it. People won't take you seriously. That's my opinion. Obviously, that's brilliant. People can argue against that, but that's that's just my personal opinion. And do you have that booth built in to a, a section of of your home, or is it somewhere it else? It was it was an old um, uh, cupboard that the person before was using as his little keyboard studio. So we kicked it out, we widened it, uh, put plasterboard, uh, compressed rock wool, um, uh, and then an air gap, and then a layer of T Tech Sound T fifty. It's called. I got they got that from. Sound on sound, which is like a heavy acoustic mineral that hangs. Then another air gap. Then underlay. Then another air gap. Then the finish. All that stuff is at the top. All that stuff is at the bottom. There's a curtain with it. It's like Fort Knox in there, Mike. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, I've I've heard your voiceovers, Darren, and they certainly sound extremely professional. And I think it does make the difference. I think we could do a whole session just on on soundproofing because I think it's such an important thing that you get right. In fact, I conducted a survey uh, not so long ago asking people what is the most important thing that you can have when you're producing and creating voiceovers. Uh, number one, of course, was the microphone, not surprisingly. Uh, then the computer that you're actually using. A lot of people were interested in having the right computer. And then after that, it was soundproofing. Yeah. As I said, you know, people, I, I mean, I'm not an audio producer, but I'm sure it would make your job much more difficult, Mike, if I was to give you a voiceover and you could hear, you know, my voice bouncing off walls and the ceiling, then you'd, you'd probably think, oh, God, now I've got to start polishing turds before we even get to his voice. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I suppose I could just up the reverb or the echo, you know, add extra effects. <laughs> there you go. Lovely. It's nice to have a pure dry voiceover. Uh, so, Darren, welcome along. Uh, let's go along to the right. And welcome, uh, Norbert. Norbert, welcome along. Uh, tell me who you are and what you do. Um, my name is Norbert, and uh, I run a company called Syndicast. We produce and uh, syndicate electronic music radio shows and podcasts. That's it. <laughs> now, you're a producer yourself, so you deal with voiceovers. Do you uh, prefer it if the voiceover artist sends you the audio through processed, or would you prefer to get the raw voice? Uh, we usually use only... So we always buy dry, dry voiceovers. Dry voice, cool. and then you can. Yeah, because we, we, yeah, I have a team, and you know, they they make everything. Brilliant! And what's your favorite bit of audio kit, Norbert? <laughs> my my MacBook. <laughs> The Mac, well, absolutely, I can't argue with that. <laughs> I switched to Mac earlier this year, and uh, I, I can't ever see myself going back to a PC. Uh, they crashed far too many times. I can th see a thumbs up there from Darren. Uh, the only issue I still have using the Mac is in Adobe Audition CS6. It was basically Adobe Audition CS 5.5 that switched me over to Mac, because I thought, well, now I can get Adobe Audition on the Mac. I, there's nothing I can't do on a Mac that I couldn't do on a PC before. Um, is that occasionally I still get crashes when I'm editing heavy sessions in Adobe Audition, mm. even on the Mac, and that really upsets me. <laughs> I use only CS5, so I haven't experienced that. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to explore a little bit about uh, CS CS6 tonight, so uh, perhaps some some nice new features as well in there. Let's um, welcome Rob. Rob, and who who else is with you there, Rob, in in your room, your booth? Good evening, Mike. Good evening, guys. I have Ross Anstel, who's a technical producer for Cross Counties Radio. He's not long been a volunteer for the station. He's learning everything. Uh, for the station as well, and I've been this side of the mic most of my life, and now I want to be the other side and start learning the producing side more. 
Fantastic. Cross Counties Radio, where in the world is that based? We're based in Leicestershire. We're a community radio station, internet-based only, and everybody on the station is a full-time volunteer, basically. Nobody gets paid whatsoever. But the standard that we, we turn out of music is absolutely quite good for a community-based station. Excellent. And what is it that convinced you to turn away from on-air presenting and turn towards the, um, the production room? I, well, I, I don't think I'm turning away from it. Um, I'm very much interested in um, voiceover work, but also I want to know more about the production side, more about the technical side of CS6, what you can do with it, multi-tracking, everything that goes with it. So, you know, this is a big leap for me as well. I was quite ignorant before to it, so now I really want to get to get with it. Excellent. And your favourite bit of audio kit there, Rob? Oh, I think it's got to be in my mic and my DBX286S. The DBX286S. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. I've got one of those. Your recommendation. I'm using it tonight, actually. I could maybe uh, turn a few of the settings around, so um, distort the voice a little bit, perhaps. <laughs> Overload it. Let's uh, head across. Uh, staying in your room, Russ. Uh, tell me, tell me a little bit about what what you do and uh, your background in audio. Um, well, basically, I only started what November last year, really. Um, and I do audio production. I uh, edit talkback section of the radio that we do. Um, I present traffic and travel as well on a daily basis. Sort of care lines, entertainment, that sort of thing. Wonderful. And have you got a favourite bit of audio kit? Um, yeah, it's the Behringer VMX 1000 I've got. Wow. The, um, yeah. Nice. And does it work well? It works very well. Great, great. Rob and Russ, welcome along. Uh, heading over to Robin. Robin, hello, welcome. Good, good evening, Mike. Good evening, everybody. Hello. You, look, you look extremely serious there with a the big microphone in front of you. What model is that? <laughs> Everybody says to me that the microphone does look big, but underneath this sock, this microphone is tiny. <laughs> Not as tiny as a Norman, no. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the budget uh, MXL 990, uh, which I got from Amazon uh, last year, and uh, love it. Won't turn away now. It's love it, love it. You purchased a condenser microphone from Amazon. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I did. <laughs> you can get anything on Amazon, can't you? I mean, I was I was looking for um, different products on Amazon. I still can't see the DBX two eight six S. I'd love the day no. to come along when that appears. Up there. No, no. But, um, it's interesting, actually, isn't it? When you're looking for a good microphone or a bit, good bit of audio kit, where do you go to to, to for reviews? I know. Um, uh, I think it was Darren mentioned just a moment ago, Sound on Sound is quite yeah. a good place to find sort of reviews and ideas about bits of kit to get. But where else do you go? You can't really, there's not many reviews on Amazon, surely, for, uh, for good, good bits of kit. Well, I mean, me, if I'm looking for a particular piece of kit, I mean, the first place I normally start is eBay, just to see what sort of is around. Is available going second hand, say, for I can say. Uh, and then in terms of reviews, I tend to just, um, well, just go to suppliers really and see what's out there. I mean, uh, one of the major suppliers that I don't really want to mention names, but one of the uh, major websites I tend to go to for reviews these days is Sound on Sound. Mm. And uh, I also have a look at um, uh, supplier websites too, as well. I mean, the, one of the major suppliers that I use mostly. Uh, and I've kitted most of the studio out through them, is um, Dolphin Music. And uh, I actually got the mixing console secondhand off eBay, which is quite a good bargain. Um, but everything else, the mic, the, obviously the mic I got from Amazon, but the, the, the preamp that I use, the Behringer uh, 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 processors that I've got here, uh, all of that was bought from Dolphin. So uh, I get good bargains through them. That's brilliant. Good stuff. And what is it you actually do, Robin? Uh, well, uh, occupationally, I work for uh, the BBC Academy in uh, London White City, uh, where we deliver training and I deal with all their systems there. But uh, uh, personally, outside of work, uh, I do uh, an internet uh, radio broadcast uh, at the weekends uh, in the county of Kent here in the UK, and uh, that's on Affinity Radio. And uh, that station started up just two years ago as just a small bedroom radio station, as it normally would do. But uh, now the listeners are going up and up and up each day. Uh, so the station now is obviously doing something right. Uh, but we've now got um, 
eight presenters uh, on that station and they've all got their own kit at home. Uh, I've been to see some of their kits and they're just running the basics. Really. But, uh, it's amazing what you can do, but I mean, uh, obviously what I do there, um, I also do their audio production work as well, so I've started producing some uh, good jingles for them as well. And uh, they're going well and getting great listening feedback as well. So how is the landscape for internet radio right now, Robin? Would you say that the tide is turning and more and more people are going to go to listen online or are we still going to stay in a landscape where traditional radio is still the most popular medium for people? Uh, I would probably think online is really taking off now. Uh, people obviously can now access their favourite radio station pretty much anywhere now uh, on their mobile phones, on their laptops, their, their tablet PCs, their iPods, their iPads. Uh, this smartphone, uh, so you know it's it's really taken off. I mean, personally, I've uh, been, obviously loved radio since childhood. I've seen it come up from the ground, from you know long wave, medium wave, uh, FM, right through to the present day DAB, and uh, obviously here now on the internet. And I've actually now this is how popular it is <coughs> in this in my home. I've actually got six internet radios, so they they wow. are all wired up to my Wi-Fi. And no matter which room I go in, I can just switch it on, and I've got access, you know, to twenty-five thousand radio stations or more. And, you know, I'm spoiled for choice, really. <laughs> but uh, I would say, if you if you're looking for, for a particular genre of music, the internet's the way to go. Do you not find that overwhelming, having so much choice of radio to listen to? For instance, on my Apple TV, I've got about three or four favorite radio stations programmed in as the presets. Mm. And I never tend to deviate from them. And I read an interesting article the other day about podcasting, um, saying that, yep, there are a lot of independent podcasters out there creating great stuff, but if you look at the top charts of the podcasts, it's all the well-known radio brands that we can pick up, like the BBC, like Absolute. Um, you know, when are the tides going to turn, or are people always naturally going to gravitate, do you think, to two or three or four different brands, even mm. with the Mm, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point, actually. Uh, I mean, in terms of podcasting, obviously, yes, the well-known popular stations here in the UK obviously do get top in iTunes, for example. Just use them as an example there. Um, but in terms of the podcasts, I tend to shop around a bit. Um, I use Podomatic. It's a good website to go to. And uh, uh, the most recent one I've attempted to uh, listen to, obviously, uh, is the Spreaker. Of course, Spreaker's come a long way. I'm a member of Spreaker myself, so I've got my own radio show oh, okay, uploaded yeah. there. Uh, in fact, yourself, I believe, uh, some voice some voiceovers for them. <laughs> great, great voice you get as you, every time you press play. Um, but yeah, so that, that, you know, if you just want to shop around a bit, you know, you just basically go to Google, Yahoo, wherever, and just you know, type in internet radio podcast, wherever. And you know, if there's a particular genre out there that you like and a particular subject that you follow, it's out there. You know, it doesn't have to be on iTunes. It's there. I find it very interesting that you're currently doing the production and presenting for a local mm. internet radio station. How does that work? Are all your <laughs> listeners in Kent? Or? <laughs> that, that, do you know what? That's a very good point. Even though the listeners are going up and up and up, uh, we've noticed that about 97% of the listeners are from the US, believe it or not. So they, they either like that English sound that we have, uh, the audio processing, maybe they like that. Maybe they like the style of music that we play or the genres of shows. I mean, we've got um, you know a Northern Soul show that goes out on Sunday, and the guy there presents it from his uh, studio up in Scotland. So you know he's got that Scottish sound, Northern sound. So um, you know people come to him basically. And, you know we believe that uh, you know overseas people are coming to us purely to listen to our accents and <laughs> music really uh, but you know we are trying so hard to promote ourselves here in the county uh, and it's working but the trouble is obviously you know with lack of funding as any internet radio station does in the community radio uh, you know it's hard it really is but uh, you know we promote ourselves on Twitter promote ourselves on Facebook you know we go around uh, and they, they are coming, they are coming, but, you know, 97% of our listeners are from the U.S. Definitely. Well, you've got the uh, the big boys to compete with. And I think, really, with internet radios such as Affinity Radio in Kent, it's the expanding universe theory, isn't it? The more money you are able to make from doing those broadcasts, you can reinvest back into marketing, back into other ideas, and get the word out there, and hopefully reach as many people as possible and, you know, get as big as it's, it's possible to get, you know? Yeah, so that's, yeah. That's great. 
I mean, a year ago when we obviously first launched, we had a huge, massive poster campaign. We've got taxis going around the Medway towns right now with our logo printed on them. Uh, so they're getting obviously huge promotion there. Uh, we've got the local um, butchers in the high street up the road from where I live. Uh, they are sponsoring the station now, so uh, they're doing our, our news. Even though we get the news provided to us from uh, Feature Story News, uh, which is free to us, um, obviously the jingles at the beginning and the end of the newscast uh, are sponsored, so we are getting some income at least coming in to invest back into our equipment and obviously, you know, get out there and market the station more. Really good to hear about internet radio making money. Uh, what's your favourite bit of audio kit, Robin? For me, it's got to be this MXL 990 and also my wonderful Behringer processors down here, which is uh, an old piece of kit, actually. I've had it for 12 years now, but I would love a DBX. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a Behringer before. Um, I think it was a model that they stopped making. I can't remember the name now. I think it was the 2496 or something like that, the, the VX Pro or something. That's and coming was, back. Oh, it was an excellent bit of kit, and they stopped making it. I have no idea why. But so I did, I, did my yeah. I did my research and went for the DBX286S because that tends to be a really popular one. Mm. And I have to say I'm not disappointed with that, so that's yeah. great. I mean, my mic itself, I, in terms of a preamp, I just used one of uh, Behringer's um, 30-pound uh, tube preamps here, the Mic 200. Uh, which I can uh, actually use to obviously have various presets on there, so I get a nice deep sound in my voice when I'm Fantastic. doing voiceovers. Uh, and also, it helps when I'm, you know, uh, trying to be a bit more retro in the jingles. Uh, but you know, just go straight into the um, Behringer. Uh, was it? It's an Autocom Pro, uh, which is a 12-year-old model. we looking down here. It's the uh, MDX uh, 1400. So it's a really old model. Uh, but that outputs into a multiband processor, which you're hearing my voice through now. Oh, yes. <laughs> I have got one bit of Behringer kit in my studio. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I recognize that as well. <laughs> Unfortunately, with an iMac, I need that because I, I tend to get awful interference, so that cuts it all out of you the do, studio yeah. monitors. Yeah, the only interference I get in this end is, uh, is noise uh, uh, accumulating from the fish tank, which is just behind me. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice bit of background noise. I don't think radio should be sterile anyway, so <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, that's great. Robin, welcome along. And uh, we got Wayne in the Hangout as well. Yeah. Wayne Fish. Hello. Hello. Who are you and what do you do? Well, I'm one of the, what we'll say, one half of the musical creativity uh, team behind Bootleggers Music, Mike, as you well know. Um, created a few intros for us over the past few years, and um, also kind of freelance producer for DMC, DJ Only Label. Right Fantastic. There. So lots of uh, beat matching and remixing and bits Absolutely, like that. Yeah. Is, there, is there any art to picking songs that will match together, or is it just kind of, you know, play and well, see what works? Providing all the harmonics go, and all your, your songs are all in key, and just go from there, basically. So it's, it might, kind of like, it's kind of like hit and miss, really. You pick the songs, we go from there, and if they work, they work. If they don't, they don't. They go in the bin. Simple as. And who is your idol remixer? Have you got one particular DJ or remixer that you really respect? That's a really, really hard question to answer. Um, but I would probably say, uh, gosh, da, 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 da. I would probably go for someone like Bern Lawback. I mean, he's, he also produces for DMC as well. And yeah, but I think everyone, everyone who can actually create something like that is is very creative. And I, it, it's, it's it's very difficult to have a favourite person because everyone produces their own sort yeah. of. Yeah, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Everyone, everyone Absolutely. has their own unique yeah. points about it, and, and I think it's just brilliant. I always get blown away every year by the DJ Earworm remixes oh, yes. that get yeah. released. Yeah. They're fantastic. Uh, and what's your favourite bit of audio kit there, Wayne? I, wouldn't, I haven't got an actual piece of audio kit that I would say it's a favourite, but obviously the software that we use to create our mashups itself. So the likes of Adobe Audition and Ableton Live, we use a lot of that. So I'd say that's what helps us. Brilliant. Well, welcome along to the Hangout. Now I'm going to try and do something a little bit different here. Let's see whether I can share Adobe Audition onto the Hangout screen. Uh, it's thinking about it. I can see it. Fine. Can I? I, can I can see it. See it. Okay, Mike. I can just see a freeze frame of my face, which is rather scary. <laughs> uh, well, if you guys can all see Adobe Audition, then we can um, we can start here in the uh, in the waveform. I've got a couple of bits open already to go, uh, so I thought I'd just briefly show you through what I do with a voiceover. And 
feel free to stop me anywhere through uh, this just to chip in or ask a question or ask me to do something completely different if you're getting bored so we can we can kind of move it along and uh, share some ideas and and also if it's if it's not the way you would do it if if there's a better way or you think oh, I could do it that way or it could be that way uh, then feel free to chip in and uh, and uh, let me know but let's uh, let's get started with a voiceover for instance Let's listen to this one from Mime. Now, hopefully, you'll be able to hear this. Next week's chart first, playing the hits of today and tomorrow. Can you hear that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. It's all working. Pleased. <laughs> so, um, now I know Darren has asked me previously about saving lots of functions onto one hotkey uh, so that you can repeat them time and time again uh, with a stroke of a key rather than having to do them all at once. Uh, this is located in the favorites menu. And I've got here my voice filter, which when I click that or hit the button V, it's going to process that voice there, make it sound a little bit better. Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. And then I can just go to my history and have a look there and see that I've normalized it. I've added some compression, dynamics processing, uh, normalized and added EQ. So I can just undo that now and you can see those processes backwards. Um, if I go into the... Amplitude and compression. That's actually up in the effects menu there. Normalize. And you can normalize that up to maximum. It's already normalized. I've got normalize on a hotkey here, so I can normalize this out, make that sound a little bit bigger. Um, but if I drag that now into the multi track, I'll show you roughly how I would turn that into a radio sweeper. Can you guys all follow this? Can you see this happening? Yeah, I can see yeah. So if I was to go through the media browser here and get some of my effects, I can drag in, let's see, some, a long effect there, drag that in. Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. Okay, and then pull that up there so that ends nicely. Tomorrow. And then maybe get a shorter effect. Let's see. That's a nice kick. And then I'm going to bring that kick in on the next phrase that Mima says there. Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. And then to bring Mima's voice up even more, what I would do is go into the first track that she's on there and go into the presets. And I've got a preset here called Processed. Now what that does is it brings in three different effects. I've got dynamics processing, a graphic equalizer, and studio reverb, because I like to add reverb to each voiceover uh, that I produce into a sweeper. Now I know that um, some uh, sort of modern formats, certainly uh, CHR formats, prefer to steer clear of studio reverb, but I, I prefer to put a little bit on, so let's have a listen to this. Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. And then just to add another effect, Usually, what I do is I would put maybe a couple of effects in a couple of these tracks here and say add on a different effect like um, modulation and chorus. Put the bass chorus in there. And then I can drag perhaps this word here where she says first. First. And hmm. pull that down here. First, playing the hits of today and tomorrow. And there you Mike, go. how did you do that? How did you just copy that one little section? Uh, oh, to copy a any section of any audio, you uh, if you zoom in and select, maybe maybe we'll select the word tomorrow. And tomorrow, tomorrow. So select that little bit there where she says tomorrow, yeah. and then it's Control C or Command C on the Mac, yeah. and then you can go to another track on your multi-track, and Control or Command V. And that drops it in there. Okay. All right. you, can, you can move it around with the, uh, the right click on your mouse. But also, um, a good thing to bear in mind is you can actually split up a track. So if you've got a voiceover in there, you can actually split it up by doing Command and K. There you go. And you can see I've split there the tomorrow bit off. And tomorrow. And you I can think right that's click. That's the way I I'd normally do it, but it's interesting. That's probably quicker for you doing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you can do it. You can do it either way. You can split it up. Uh, you can also move it away, and you can drag out like that. So you can 
drag it and double it up and pull it down here. First, playing the hits of today and tomorrow. Tomorrow. First, playing the hits of today and tomorrow. Tomorrow. And actually, what I might do there is put tomorrow in on track five. Process that up. And add some echo. What I always encourage when adding different effects is to have a play with them and maybe change them around a bit. So I've got mic echo there and I usually left channel I echo by 400 milliseconds and then I just double it on the right channel. And tomorrow. tomorrow. So that's a, a basic radio sweeper created from scratch. Do you, does anyone have any questions? Can you, can you just play it again for us, Mike? Sure. Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. 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 I mean, I think when, what I liked, Mike, was how quick it was. How quick which, you put that. Yeah. <laughs> You've been practicing, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> knock, it, knock a few out every day. <laughs> yeah. Are you, can I ask, you know when you, um, I've, I've um, been listening to all your podcasts in the last few days, and I'm pretty blown away by the production. I mean, I've got to admit, I just think, You've got a great ear. I don't know if you're a musician or you, you, you know, you play an instrument, but you've you, you've got a very very good ear. Now, um, when you're building up jingles and sweepers, are you literally just, oh, we'll drag this in. Well, you know, this is my sort of go-to effect, or because you like punctuating things with like a bass drum. So if there's a word, it's you'll have breaks. You'll, I mean, it's all going on. Are you literally just like? Oh, we'll chuck a bit of this in. We'll see what happens there. And oh, I like that. Well, let's flange this. Or is it? Have you got like a, a game plan that you're? Why are you laughing? Have you got a game plan that that you're that you're before? You know, you you go you you attack anything. Yep. I uh, well, what I do is I I tend to have my favourite effects that I always have stored. In fact, one thing that I really should do, and it would be a massive time saver for me, which I I still haven't got round to is saving all of my favorite effects into multi-track presets uh, which I can then just load up immediately into each track so say track one could be just the dry processed voice tracks two and three I usually use for sound effects or music beds and then four five and six what I'd like to do is have my favorite effects in each track so that yes you're right I could have a chorus effect a flange effect and an echo effect. Those would probably be my top three effects that I would go for in any normal multi-track session where I'm producing a radio sweeper. And then um, the best thing about CS6, I don't know, can you see my face at the moment? Yes. Yeah. So if I screen share again and go back to Adobe, um, what I would tend to do here, the great thing about Adobe Audition CS 5.5 and 6 is that you can go right the way through your media browser and you can pick out any effect and audition it straight away. So I can go into here and I can go into my rock effects and I can just go and I can click on effect until eventually I'll find the right effect that I think is going to match the voice. So it's, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of throwing things in and seeing what works and then coming back and trying something else. Um, often, because I know my effects library so well, I'll just say that's going to work really well with that voice overall. That's going to work really well mixed like that. Um, and I think the danger is that you can become a little bit lazy with your production. I don't know if any other um, seasoned professionals would agree with me on that uh, in here, but you can actually get into a routine where you have your favorite effects, you know where all of the uh, sound effects that you're going to put in are, and you just tend to draw them in and use them. And what I really want to do in the sort of idea of doing this mastermind with uh, lots of other people who have a background in audio or want to learn about audio is to maybe find new ways of producing that perhaps I haven't thought about before. Um, because, yeah, you, you do tend to get into a routine. I don't know if anybody else would like to, to chip in with um, their way of producing audio. If, um, if anybody has uh, produced a sweeper recently or put an effect on a voiceover, would, would anyone tend to agree with the statement that you have your favorite effects and you tend to stick with them or... Well, I know Russ does because he, he does some uh, for the station. I say cross counties. And does and so he sticks with uh, with a certain amount of effects and. Uh, 
would you would you go any further than the effects that are your favourites, Russ? Or um, probably, yeah. I just need probably experiment with a few extras, but I'm, I've got a few favourites I use. Excellent. Excellent. And Norbert, obviously being um, a producer yourself, what would be your take on this? Are there certain effects that you tend to find are the, the favourite effects to use in, in production? Yeah, probably the same effects. But the problem is because uh, we produce most of the radio shows that we syndicate, and we always have to, you know, every single show has to be a little bit different. Because you know, if you produce one intro for one artist, and uh, yep. the same effect for the other one. Oh, fucking hell, you know, this mine is the same as yours. So it's always you have to prepare something different, exactly. and it's really, really hard. Always, you know, have to find new libraries and everything. Like that. So it's, Absolutely. I think it's hard. It is definitely to 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 be creative when you're starting out creating uh, radio sweepers. I, I I remember when I first started with radio production and audio production, I was always tweaking and experimenting with different effects, and I really think that is the way to go. I mean, Robin, where where would you sort of chime in on this um, with sort of experimenting with different effects? How how do you tend to go with effects? You sent me a sweeper over the other day where you you sort of messed about with the reverb. How is it that you get to those effects? Do you just yeah? Well, try I mean, things? I've I've been using audio production, digital audio production since the days of Call Edit Pro, uh, the the original Call cool Edit, and um, I it was always one for just having to play around with effects and dynamics processing, um, but um, obviously since coming to Adobe Audition, I'm, I'm currently on five. Uh, version 5.5 here, uh, so I'd love to upgrade to 6, but uh, uh, obviously when I, the, la the last few sweepers I've sent you is basically just been me playing around with some of the effects there. Uh, but one question I was going to ask you, Mike, is obviously you were uh, previewing your effects there, um, I saw on, on the left-hand side there. Uh, how were you doing that? Was that just sort of your files in view there, and you're just basically doing an autoplay on, on the file each time you're clicking it? Absolutely, yep. Um, if you uh, if you look at the uh, the media browser there, I don't know how clear it is on your screen, um, but you can see all the effects here. And then at the bottom, there are three buttons. There's a play, there's a loop, and then this button here is the autoplay button. So if I take that off, like that, and then go through, none of the effects will play. But I always have that selected on, so I can just very, very quickly go through it. And I can find exactly the effect I want really easily. So, is that Mike. a feature that? Yes, Darren. Sorry, Mike, just a quick one. I'm, I'm back to that uh, control pane. Um, I've, I have a file where I have effects on my desktop, where it's it's actually sat on my desktop, but I can't see the desktop I icon in that pane. I've got my C drive, my D, E, and F backup, an external drive, but I physically can't see the desktop. You can't see the desktop uh, over here where, where you've got the effects. No, on my own screen. My, my, where my effects are on my computer, they're sat on my desktop at the minute. But okay. I, can, I physically can't see my desktop on CS6. I think you would need to go through, uh, certainly on a Mac here, I've got the desktop. It's located here because you've got volumes and then you've got the Macintosh HD, and then you have to go into Users, and then I've got wow. Users MRC, and then Desktop is in there, so I can click Desktop, my desktop's empty got there. Got it, yes, um, got it, yes. It's the same, it's the same it. for Windows, yeah. Absolutely, so then, uh, then I can go through, I'll find my tools there again, and there we go, there are the tools. So, Can I so ask yeah. a question, Mike? Yeah, go for it, Darren. Um, I... Um, with the production elements I have, um, they're all in iTunes, and iTunes, as you know, likes to um, play the daddy and sort things out for you, oh, yes. um, <laughs> which is not the best thing in the world. So, um, as far as the media browser and you know, trying to navigate to where iTunes wants to put things, it's very messy, and I don't know where anything is. So, um, how have you got yours? Have you have you put yours in iTunes? Have you got yours on a? Uh, do you avoid iTunes altogether? Because yours are obviously nice and neatly, and you know where everything is, and they're all categorised. I'd just be interested to know how you've got all your effects and bits and pieces. 
I think categorizing effects is is so so important, and I would just recommend completely steering clear of iTunes. Right. <laughs> if you want to categorize sound effects, um, yeah, like you say, iTunes likes to categorize everything in in certain folders and places. Uh, so when you drag music in there, of course it puts it into a subfolder and it's all stored away. I think it's in the music folder. You go into music and then iTunes and then artists and then it's all in yes, there. Yeah. What I prefer to do is create a folder in the documents folder. So I would go into documents and I have a folder called production and then tools and then I have all my volumes and then I subcategorize all of those volumes into effects, beds, rock, country, CHR effects. What I'd like to do, if I, if I had the time to sit down and categorize, I don't know how many thousands of sound effects I've got, but uh, if I had the time, I would love to create different folders saying, you know, bass kicks and, you know, cymbals and, you know, clashes and crashes, because I, I find that as a producer, you sometimes know exactly the sound effect you're looking for, and if you don't have them categorized well, you can spend ages just previewing, you know, 10 sound effects before you find exactly the right one you want. Especially um, when you get whoosh one, whoosh yes. two, whoosh three. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right, yeah. And and I think it's the same with voiceovers, and I, I wish I did this more often. But again, it's just it comes down to having time to categorize all the voiceovers. I would love to save every voiceover session I do with a label as to what that voiceover is, what was said in that session, so I can instantly refer back to it if you need it, if you need something in a sweeper you're making. So, for instance, one of the most common phrases uh, probably that people ask for in a radio sweeper is in the mix. The number of times I've created a sweeper that contains the words in the mix is unbelievable. But if I had taken the time to maybe save many different voiceover artists saying in the mix into one folder, I could maybe highlight a sweeper by, if it was a female sweeper, I could drop in a male vocal also saying in the mix, you know, as a kind of bonus. So I, I think it's absolutely categorizing all your sound effects and all your vocals, if at all possible, is key, but it, it definitely does come down to having time. So. The thing is though, Mike, you're easier to access than Ed Weagle. Say that again, Rob. I'm not sure you're, I understand. You're, you're a lot easier to access than Ed Weagle. Right. Okay. <laughs> fair play, fair play. Uh, so, uh, anyone else want to sort of learn anything in particular or share any knowledge? Ben, you um, you edit a lot of interviews for podcasts. How do you find it if there's a, a tricky phrase in uh, some audio that you're editing? How do you get around that if someone stumbles or stutters? Or do you just leave it all in and keep it natural? Yeah, I've done quite a lot of different um, bits and pieces through the years. I did a show on uh, KMFM called The Saturday Show for quite a long time. I must admit, it's a difficult thing that when you start editing a piece of audio, and where, where do you stop? <laughs> because you can just keep on uh, tightening it up if you've got that time. And um, I, I must admit that I do go through all the audio, and because I'm now doing podcast interviews, it's actually it's longer audio, so it takes longer to edit. But, yeah, I do try and tidy up anything that you can edit out. When you listen back to it, the key thing for me is that you don't hear the edit. If it just sounds normal, as soon as you think, well, then that's, that doesn't flow anymore, then I just leave in the um, uh, whatever it might be. And do you spend a lot of time on your podcast post-production, or how much time would you say you actually spend recording a podcast as compared to editing the podcast afterwards? For instance, with the Music Radio Creative podcast I make, I spend probably um, 10 or 20 minutes voicing it, but then I can spend a lot longer in post. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a weird one that I, I would say probably I do spend longer in post-production, but it's, it's more on editing the interview as, as, as just really refining it. And then when I go and put all the bits together, I've got all the elements all ready to go. I don't have to worry about mixing up any sweepers or anything. Just put them all into place and, and then I'm ready to go. So that bit of editing is really quick because I just hear it all together. But the, the editing of an interview, as I say, I get... I probably spend too long on it where I should actually just say, no, just let it go. But I haven't learned that lesson yet. Absolutely. Um, now, another little uh, trick I wanted to show in Adobe Audition, if I go back into my screen share mode there, you should be able to see Adobe Audition. Uh, if I take this sweeper that I've created here with Mimer and actually go and mix that down, let's go and find the mix down. In fact, I have it on hotkey. I can't remember where it is in the menu. I just hit D. There we go, mixing down. 
when it appears there in the waveform. Um, if I wanted to put that on the internet as a demo, I would compress it one more time. I would go to amplitude and compression, multiband compression, and it appears on my second screen on the dual screen, so I just need to drag that across. Now there are loads of compressors in here. Some of the compressors in the multiband compressor I, found, I find a little bit harsh. For instance, the broadcast is, is very harsh, but uh, if you're a fan of Ken Bruce, Popmaster, that's, <laughs> that's my favorite favorite compressor. So I go for the Popmaster, and what that actually does is it nicely neatens it down, and it actually makes it a little less than, it doesn't take up the whole screen, so it's not fully amplified, which I find is quite nice. So this will sound really good for an internet demo. Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. 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 Mike, can you recap that? I didn't really understand. What, what have you actually done there? Have you made it so that it's not hitting zero dB? So that it's it's not, if I bring that down a little bit, you'll be able to see the dynamic range. There's a, there's a lot of range to that sweeper, as you can see there. It, so it's not very heavily compressed. And if I was sending that out uh, to a client, I would send it probably the uncompressed version unless I was specifically asked uh, simply because if that sweeper is going to be played on the radio or on an internet station or a, maybe a podcast that already has some processing on it you run the risk of doubly compressing the sweeper and making it sound really crunchy and awful and distorted um, but if I was to put it up on the internet as a demo I'd want it to be as loud as possible so that somebody can turn up their speakers and hear it straight away without having to sort of really listen in and turn it up and turn it down I mean there are a lot of different examples where dynamic range can go up and down in in a piece of production but I would simply go to effects amplitude and compression multiband compressor and you can um, you can preview it Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. And you can actually... Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. You can actually tomorrow. move the compressor around so you can, you can test out what, what you think might work well uh, and then apply those settings. And then that nicely brings, brings it all up to one level. Next week's chart, first playing the hits of today and tomorrow. 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 So, so there you go. So I would, yeah, absolutely recommend uh, having hotkeys and presets. That's, that's very important when producing uh, lots and lots of different radio sweepers. How do you find it, Rob, in, in your studio? You, uh, I can see your mixing desk actually now over there. And, and the Chris Evans memoirs yeah, just, of a fruitcake. I've just changed their cameras. That's very clever. <laughs> You've got two cameras on your setup. Very impressive. <laughs> yeah, well, I do a video uh, cast as well each time I do my radio shows. Uh, so I, I simulcast the uh, uh, the radio show live on the internet as well as sending out a, a video cast of it as well via uh, Justin.tv, which is uh, which is great, and it also pulls in more of the listings as well. Um, yeah, That's so absolutely in, fantastic. In, in terms of the processing, um, yeah, I mean that is something that I obviously love. I've got a good ear for processing. And uh, the one thing that uh, really aggravates me is when I hear too much processing. And I was quite annoyed at myself quite recently when I produced a lovely, lovely jingle, lovely sweeper. Uh, I think one of the ones I've sent you, I think, actually, in the last few weeks then, Mike. Um, but um, when I heard it go out on air, I, I just felt embarrassed. I really did. Um, Probably because I was listening to it on my Wi-Fi radio with a mono speaker rather than through my hi-fi system. Uh, I mean, through the headphones and through the stereo, it's great. But as soon as it went to air and uh, coming out mono, I, I could hear all the phasing. So it was it was just dreadful. So I immediately came straight into the studio and just uh, went right down to nothing again and just sent them a, a, a clean cut. And uh, now it's going out beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it takes for that radio sweeper to actually play out on the air before you hear it back and you hear how it sounds. Mm. That, that was always the mistake I made when I was first starting in radio production on FM radio stations. And I'd make a sweeper and I'd compress it and compress it again and really compress it right down. And you suddenly hear it back on the radio and the voice would be drowned out by the music or you know, vice versa, you'd only hear the voice and hardly any music. So it is difficult to get that mix right. Mm. And one of the problems that I have is obviously I've, I've got a nice voice, a nice deep sound to my voice, uh, especially when I get on this microphone and I start recording my, my, uh, my, my jingles obviously from dry. 
Uh, and when it comes to production, and I start messing around with everything, you know, uh, th there's obviously some tools that I'm starting to notice within Adobe Audition that uh, helps me kind of just, I don't know, just, just filter out some of the highs and the lows in my voice. Uh, because I'll pronounce certain words, and certain letters come out as too much of a, you know, I, I, it just sounds dreadful. Uh, most recently, you know, I said the words rook, you know, and I emphasized the k so much that uh, it just brings it right up. Yeah, that's right. It just it, it was just like that. Uh, is that not so, to do with your mic? Is that not to do with your your mic though? No, I mean I'm not an expert, but uh, well, I did realize that I had a bit too much EQ on the mic, so I, I cut that back, uh, and then I also cut back on the uh, processing slightly because obviously the microphone itself comes into the uh, the recording suite slightly processed anyway, so I turned that all off. I just went clean, uh, and I just came away from the microphone slightly more, and just re just re-recorded that cut, and it right. came out all right in the end. A great thing that you can do with a voiceover, if you're hoping to put it over a music bed, sometimes it's really difficult to get a, a voiceover to cut across some music beds, especially if there's a, a lot of dynamic range to them. All the greatest hits of today. I mean, that doesn't sound too bad. But for instance, what I might do is uh, uh, one of the tips actually that Dave Fox teaches in one of his tutorials, which is to uh, use the FT FFT filter in Adobe Audition and just knock off all of the bass from the voiceover. Take that all out. So any frequency below around 400 hertz, just knock it completely out of the voiceover. All the greatest hits of today. And then I might move that up in the chain because the uh, issue here is that that filter is getting applied after the compression has been added. And ideally, uh, you want to add it before the compression is added. Otherwise, you're going to lose the, the, the original compression that you had. So I would move that up to the top. All the greatest hits of today. And if I get maybe another music bed that has uh, maybe a stronger sound to it. Yep, that's quite a loud bed. So this should really cr cut across now. All the greatest hits of today. And then of course you can highlight the end and copy it and uh, and paste and do a little bit of stutter at the end. All the greatest hits of today, day, day. And Whoa, hold across. on! Oh, you can't get away with doing that quickly. What? 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 what <laughs> 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 okay. So I'll just undo that and show you, Darren. Uh, so, uh, if if you want to cut off uh, a bit of the voice over here, you can select the end, uh, right. Command C to copy it, and then just look for the beats in the uh, in the music bed there. So you can usually you can see where where a beat is going to appear in the music bed. Right. So here's one here, and um, where you see the, the orange lines crossing over, that's a fade in, fade out. Right. And do that, and do that again. Hey, you can do little bits like that. So um, you're literally, you're literally can, uh, Apple C and then um, Apple V on each beat, uh, and then um, where the tail end is longer, it, it automatically sticks across fade in for you. Exactly. Yeah. So it'll make right. it sound really good, and you can um, you can do all sorts of other bits. Like uh, for instance, if I was to take this away here and. You can maybe do half a beat and then speed it up to a full beat, so like this and like that. So do it like that for four and then yeah. ring it in on each different beat. And there are various different bits you can do as you experiment with music beds. Also, another good thing to do with a music bed, uh, if you really want the voice to cut across, is again, go into your um, filter and EQ, and maybe bring the graphic equalizer up. Uh, and if I put that to, let's see whether I can find a reset here to put it back to normal. 
or simply just the mid cut. There we go. If you take out the mid range of a music bed, it will help voiceovers to cut across as well. All the greatest hits of today, day, day. And then if I mix that down, just maybe that short section there. Again, mixing down is in the uh, the menu. I believe it's in the multi-track menu track. Is there a keyboard My shortcut for that, Mike? Uh, well, uh, not by default, but um, again, if you go into your favorites, uh, and then actually it's in, here it is, edit, keyboard shortcuts, you can assign any menu feature to a keyboard key. Uh, so for instance, to mix down, I've assigned the D button for that, so that whenever I hit the D button, uh, it will mix down that the, the whole multi-track session. Uh, and then I've got... I've got this little bit here now all mixed down. All the greatest hits of today, today, today. And if I go into the effects and amplitude and compression and multiband compressor, I can then apply the pop master. You'll never be able to think of the pop master without thinking of Ken Bruce now. All the greatest hits of today, today, today. There you go, and that's a compressed sweeper ready to put up on the internet as a demo. Um, Mark, you, you know that mix down, uh, is that the same thing that I haven't got an audition, that when you go ex export and it puts dot mix down or something at the end of your file, is that the same thing? Mix down, yeah, absolutely. When you get mix down at the end of your file, that's the, uh, the mix down from the session. Okay, so that's what you've you. mixed from the session, and then you can save that as, as whatever you'd like. Uh, you can also, another thing, uh, not, not to get uh, too far ahead of myself, but you can, um, you can bounce down different parts of a session. So say, for instance, you maybe had a um, mimer in here saying something. Next week's chart. So you had that in as well, and she's got an echo there. Next week's chart. Next week's chart. chart. And you wanted to bounce down that little bit of mimer there. What I could do is select... That area there. Mike, we're looking at you. Oh, <laughs> so you are. <laughs> Let's screen share. Here we go. I can right click here where I put Mimer and you can bounce to new track, the selected track there. And that's going to bounce down Mimer, although it hasn't bounced down the whole echo. So what I might need to do for that is bounce to new track, time selection. There you go, and that's Mimer with Echo. And then I can actually take that effect, fade off at the end nicely, and I can bring that up, that bounce track, and I can drop that in somewhere else. Next week's chart. All the greatest hits of so you can bounce down inside a session, a sort of mini mix down and move things around on the screen. But I think we're pretty much running to time there. So it's... Uh, as we record live, it's, uh, it's 10 o'clock, so any, any questions... Just a quick one, Mike. Um, yeah. Going to the favourites where you, where we record uh, the macro from your last tutorial. Um, I followed your instructions to record to the macro for the hotkey, but it wouldn't do it on my PC. Recording a macro, yep, yeah, that can be that can be quite a task if you're doing it the first time. <laughs> um, so let me let me show you how you would record a macro uh, with success. Very I tried one there. last night, and I got everything round the wrong order. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I'm thing. You're, you're under the spotlight when you're recording a macro. You've got to do it exactly the way you want it to turn out. Um, so say, for instance, if I go to um, a voiceover here by Rachel, and I want to start recording a macro, I'll go into Favorites, start recording. It's actually known as a favorite, but uh, of course you may well know it as a macro. Start recording favorite, and then you need to do each thing you want to do. So say Effects. Multiband compressor, pop master. That will apply that, and then maybe effects, FFT filter, knock off all the bass, and that's done. And then favorites, stop recording favorite, and then new favorite, and then that's saved now as a new favorite. There it is, new favorite. In fact, it's. It's overwritten my normalize, so I'll need to I'll need to correct that at some point. Um, and then if I go into another track that I haven't played with here, how do, how do you put that onto a hotkey though, Mike? 
Right, then to get that onto a hotkey, you'd go into Edit, Keyboard Shortcuts. Yeah. And then you'd go to the menu, which would be Favorites here. Yeah. And there it is, New I, Favorite. When I opened it up on mine, it wasn't in there, although it's in, my, in the Favorites drop-down box. But the macro I was recording didn't show up in there. Did it not? Ah. No. That's interesting. It should do. If you, um, once you've finished recording, if you give it a name, uh, then hopefully it should save into your favorites menu. Mm. But um, it it really depends if you've um, if you've recorded the the favorite, um, but you've not taken any action when you recorded the favorite and you click stop, uh, then it will it will not save. So you need to you need to make sure you start recording, uh, then do the processes you want to record and then stop recording and then hopefully it should give you a prompt to name that favorite and you should be able to go in. Um, if not, I don't know whether it's a PC issue, you could always try closing and reopening and, uh, and see whether it suddenly magically appears. But, um, I'll, I'll have another go at that tomorrow. Yeah, but once it appears there, you can then find it in the keyboard shortcuts and you can go add here and then simply type a key. So uh, maybe I'll use the, the one key. There we go. One is already in use, but uh, that's assigned one. So I can say OK or cancel, so I'll cancel that. But that's that's basically, in a nutshell, how you record a favorite and assign it to a hotkey, which I would say is it's certainly a time-saving tip. Okay, thank you. And it's quite annoying, actually, looking at the favorites here. That if you obviously are going to be a bit of a habit of doing a lot of favorites, then the list can be quite long. And you can't sort of add folders or anything like that. So it's, it's exactly. Quite a lot of scrolling. You can get overwhelmed with favorites. <laughs> the key is just to remember which key you've put your favorites onto. So I've got the, the V key is for my voiceover processing. The N key is to normalize something really quickly. And also I use the Q key, funnily enough. This is just a personal preference. The Q key is to add a silence to any part of a voiceover. Um, I, I know you probably would say, well, you should use S, but I use Q because Q in my mind stands for quiet. So uh, just use the Q key, and uh, actually I'll show you with a screen share uh, where I might use the Q key. Say this voiceover here from Drew. In fact, I can see Drew has already done this to his voiceover. He's put silences in manually between his uh, breaths and phrases. Let's go to uh, one that's not processed like that. Right, here's an example. So you might listen to this voiceover from Robin. Playing the greatest hits of all time. And sometimes I like to be really precise, and in between the little bits where he's not talking, I like to hit Q, and make sure it's nice and silent. Just a personal preference there to tidy up a voiceover, and maybe there's just a little bit at the start, I might do that as well. So Q is a, a well-used hotkey, and then when I'm in the... The multi-track session D is the key for me to uh, to mix down a session. I'd also quite like to get T on a hotkey as well to mix down just a time selection in the uh, multi-track as well. That would really help me too. So, uh, Mike, can anyone I, else want to chime in? Robert? Mike, can I just start ask, how do you uh, assign a hotkey on the PC version of Adobe Audition? Uh, the PC version should be similar to the Mac. Um, let's go back to the menu bar here, if you go into Adobe and then go to the edit menu and then just third before the bottom you should get keyboard shortcuts. I got second from the bottom on the PC version, Mike. Is it second from the bottom? Yeah. Keyboard shortcuts, uh, but also it's, um, it's on a hotkey, you can hit Alt and K to access that. Yeah. So, and that should help you to, to assign. So, Great. Any, anything else from, from you guys, or uh, are we totally pr produced out for tonight? <laughs> <laughs> um, just one last quick one, if I may, Mike. Yes. On a dry recording, if you've got rumble in the back, very low frequency, to eliminate it as quickly as possible, because I have a problem with fridge. Because, <laughs> because I'm in a flat, I'm restricted on space, so... To get rid of a rumble, well, you can always go through and, and just uh, mess with the EQ, so EQ the voice by ear, and I would always recommend with any voiceover to have a listen to the voice and EQ it to what you think sounds right for that particular voice. 
So maybe uh, some EQ settings you'd apply to a certain male voice, you wouldn't apply to a female voice. Go through yeah. and try and drop out different frequencies uh, and see whether it can make it any better. There's also great noise reduction uh, features on Adobe Audition where you can, if you can actually record uh, with your microphone uh, without doing a voiceover, so literally just the background noise, and then select that. In fact, let me see whether I can show you how that might work. Although my studio is not very noisy, so I don't think I'm going to give you a very good example. Um, record, you can record my fish tank if you like. That would be very <laughs> helpful. <laughs> if I just do Command, Shift, and N to start a new audio file here and start recording, that's my background noise. And then stop. So what I would do, Rob, is select that background noise where you're not speaking. Yeah. That's like your control. And then noise reduction restoration. In CS6, capture noise point is what you want to do. Uh, the current audio section will be captured. That's perfect. OK. Mm -hmm. Right, that's now done. And then go back to effects, noise reduction restoration. And then you go to the noise reduction process. And that's come up over here. Now you can see a nice uh, funky wave. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Green and red. Uh, yeah. So you can see all the different noises that are appearing there in your background. Um, this works best if you've got a specific uh, frequency that's interfering. So sometimes on tape recordings, you've got a specific high pitch squeal or something like that, or a low rumble. Um, as you can see here, there's nothing that particularly stands out because it's, um, it's a very quiet recording. Um, but if you had a, a fridge that was rumbling at a certain frequency, you could just simply go in here and draw on the graph the, the, the bit of the noise you want to take out or the frequency you want to take out. So, for instance, that's, the, that's one bit that I might take out. Um, but you would see on this graph if there was one particular overpowering noise in the background. For instance, if I was to just select a bit of my voice there and capture the noise print of that, you should see something different on the graph there. Noise reduction. And there you go, you can see the, the frequency of my voice there. And if there was a, a high pitch squeal, in fact, I think in Adobe Audition CS6, the effects are back, you're able to generate tones. So if I open generate tones, there we go, that's a 440 hertz tone. Pop that in there. Now if I catch the noise point of that, you'll definitely be able to see what I'm talking about. And then effects, noise reduction, noise reduction process. There you go. Do you see it? Yes. So that's 440 hertz. Now if I was to go across here and literally just reduce that right out, it should completely kill that tone. Let's make sure I get all of it. There we go. And apply. Gone. Pretty much gone. So that's what noise reduction can do for you. So if you've got a fridge that's rumbling at, at 60 hertz, then uh, capture it that way in Adobe Audition and isolate it and reduce it. Uh, but bear in mind, the more you take away of any particular frequency, the, the lower quality your finished product will be. Or you can yeah. just try and EQ it back up again afterwards. But hopefully that helps. It does indeed. Thank you, Mike. Great. And Rob, what I tend to do is I... I if I'm doing a voiceover, is I will say a few words, stop for a second or two, let some background noise around me get into the microphone, and then just carry on. And then I can see that on the waveform, then I can just capture that noise point and just get rid of it totally. Good point. Okay, I'll take the yeah, app. I'll take that on board. Thank you. Do you have that experience with your fish tank then, Robin? Have you figured out <laughs> the frequencies? I the tend tank? to turn the fish... Well, the fish tank is actually... Well, the light's on, but the pump's not at the moment. I've turned the pump off perfectly. <laughs> well, guys, um, I think we're going to call it uh, a night on the mastermind, but what I'd like to do just one final time is is just go through uh, and put all of you on the screen and just to ask you to, to talk about uh, what you do and mention your website and, uh, and say goodbye to anyone who decides <laughs> to sit through a whole hour of YouTube about audio production and voice <laughs> effects. So let's start with Ben Adam Smith. Ben Adam Smith, what's your website and where can people find you and find out more about you and what you do? 
Well, the production company is Regen Media, and the podcast, the base for that is houseplanninghelp.com. So I'll put the information there. What do you do at Regen Media? Is that audio or? It's more video, actually, but yeah, I mean, coming from a radio background, obviously, there's a fair amount of audio. Do you make professional videos? Yeah, yeah, it's um, broadcast quality, so uh, I'm, what I'm trying to do is more, move more in the way of, of how-to videos, because I'm sure you're aware, having got hundreds and thousands of hits and all the stuff that you've done on YouTube, how powerful mm -hmm. it is, so I'm trying to bring that to business. Absolutely. That's definitely a good place to be. I mean, YouTube is definitely the place to be. The amount of eyeballs on YouTube and comments and interaction you get is absolutely stunning. And um, I think it's been really fun to try this Hangout on Air tonight as well. I'll be interested to see what the reaction is to it. And if anyone manages to sit through a whole hour of it and watch it and leave a comment, then I'll, I'll be very impressed. But I know, obviously, Ben, you coming from a, a big sort of video creation background, uh, I was talking to you earlier on, and you recommended one of the, the things I could do here with this studio set up, apart from having the, the little uh, logo down, down there uh, and the logo here and the logo there. Uh, you recommended that I also get a green screen as well for yeah. the, the backdrop of the studio, which I thought was an excellent piece of advice in general. You could have the Manhattan it, skyline, couldn't you, behind you, and tell yeah, me you're in New York, <laughs> Las Vegas. That's it. <laughs> so, I send you a but, um, backdrop of the River Medway, if you like, Mike. I would absolutely <laughs> love that, Robin. The thing is, my, my background being in audio, um, when it comes to doing video stuff, in fact, I've never, ever put my face on my YouTube channel before, so I'm actually... Uh, you know, quite uh, overwhelmed at the fact that I'm doing that. <laughs> but, uh, but Ben, thank you very much because you've given me a lot of advice on uh, on the right way to do video. Um, uh, to Darren, Darren, what's your website? Where can people look you up and find out more about you? Uh, well, I'm Darren Altman, uh, voiceover artist on ISDN, and my website is voiceoverdarren.com. Voiceover, all one word, D A R R E N dot com. And that's the, all my reels and client list and videos and bits and pieces, examples of my work and lots of fun characters and impressions as well. Brilliant. Who's your favorite person to impersonate? Oh, um, don't worry, I'm not going to get you doing any impressions. I don't know. I've been working on, been working on uh, Gordon Ramsay. Damn. Uh, <laughs> hey, big boy, look at me. <laughs> That's brilliant. And uh, actually, your your website is familiar because I mentioned your website in a previous tutorial I did. You gave me the inspiration uh, to show the process of uh, processing a voiceover. That was very, very kind of you, and I'm uh, very, very grateful for that. Thank you very much. I want to go further. I want to show the process that I, I use in the multitrack, and I know I was demonstrating it a little bit tonight on the Hangout, um, but I think I will make a follow-up video um, because it's a lot easier when you're creating a video because those tutorials I, I edit up in Camtasia, and you can get everything down into four minutes, and it's like, this is how you do it, like that, that, and that, and I often find that's a, that's a better way to do tutorials, so hopefully I'll get into maybe three or four minutes the process I use in the multitrack. But Darren, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Norbert, uh, tell us uh, a little bit about what you do, where your website is, and how people can find out more about you. Yeah, I've got two websites, one's for, for the syndication, and production is syndicast.co.uk, and uh, for my personal one, it's blindsportmusic.co.uk. Brilliant, excellent, and I'll, I'll type these all up as well so people can click through to them. Norbert, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, thank you. Rob and Russ, uh, have you got websites people can access you or have, places well, we they can, can see we can you? Use our, we can use our station website, which is crosscountiesradio.com, all one word. And that's where you'll find me doing the evening show from 7 till 10 normally on the weekday. And weekends I do the news. Fantastic stuff. Oh, you're a man of many talents. So you're a radio presenter, <laughs> audio producer, and newscaster as well. How do you find it switching between being a radio presenter and a newscaster? I never thought I would ever make it as a newscaster <coughs> because being a, a radio DJ, it's very hard to read serious news headlines, isn't it, and sound like you really mean it? It is. I mean, uh, at first, I, I really couldn't get to grips with it, and I did. I really struggled. But, you know, after a, a few attempts, and I think you you... Fall, you fall actually fall into it. You, you find that your way into a pattern which you're comfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like with everything, I suppose. Practice makes perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rob and Russ, thanks for joining us, Cross Counties Radio, and uh, and Robin. How can people find out more about you? 
Uh, well, I'm on the web as uh, radiorobin.com, or of course you can go and find me on uh, Twitter as well, I'm Robin Just, and uh, I'm on Google Plus as well, uh, LinkedIn, I'm around there. And uh, yeah, apart from that, the station website as well, affinityradio.net. Definitely tune into it. Uh, an up and coming, uh, like you say, the, the listeners are rising all the time at affinityradio.net. They are indeed, yeah, yeah. We're breaking all the records each week. And you can head there and hear your audio production as well on the air. Yes, yes, indeed. Fantastic. Guys, thanks for joining the Hangout. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome.